Let's do batch normalization. Any questions about batch normalization? So for each iteration or pass through the network, the um, batch mean and standard deviation will change? Yes. During training, yes. Okay, thanks. So when you are doing your training, you have a mini batch of let's say 256 images. You push them through your neural network. And after these convolutions, you're gonna end up with uh, 256 feature maps this time. And uh, as you can see, this operation is dependent on your batch. If you change your batch, if you have 256 other images, batch norm is gonna change. But this is during training. During training, things are okay to be random. They're gonna prevent overfitting in a similar fashion that Dropout was doing. But during inference, things have to be deterministic. You don't want your neural network to give you two different results for the same image. There, what you're gonna do is you have a running average of these numbers or these vectors. And when you are gonna put your neural network in production, not only you are gonna give your weight and biases, the trained ones, to the production side of your company, you're also gonna give them mu and sigma, which are not trained. These are just averages. So there is another question on the chat. You have explained it in the video, but can you elaborate on how the gradients flow through mu and sigma squared? So that's actually a very important detail about batch normalization. Let's take a look at X1. X1 is gonna be W U1, X2 is gonna be W U2, et cetera. When you take the mean, you're gonna end up with some W. And the mean is just one over the number of observations, in this case, M of W U1, W U2, W U3, et cetera. Now, as you take the gradients in your backward pass, gradient of your loss with respect to W, not only W is appearing here in your X, the formula for X, it's gonna appear in the formula for your mean. The same thing, the same argument is the same here. Ws are appearing here. But also not only Ws from this layer, Ws of the previous layers are also gonna come in through U because U is an intermediate layer or intermediate hidden unit. It's gonna depend on previous layers, the weights and biases of previous layers. And it's important if you put a TensorFlow dot stop gradient on these quantities, your model is, got, is not gonna converge or it's not gonna be as accurate as you want. It's gonna have trouble converging. Does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. How do we choose the size of M? Is, a, is it a hyperparameter? Yes. M, your batch size, is usually set to be 32 per each GPU that you have, if you want to do data parallelism. And why is that? Because only 32 images are gonna fit on your GPU. Because not only you need to have your image, but also you need to keep storing the intermediate computations from one layer to the next one. And your entire model, in addition to your batch, they need to fit on your GPU. It means that if your X's are now not images, they are videos of higher size, then you can fit less uh, number of examples on your GPUs, therefore your mini batch is gonna be smaller. So that's a constraint, it's a physical constraint. And you can treat it as a hyperparameter also. The other question is the inference section of batch normalization is referring to using the mu and sigma from training to perform batch normalization on validation and test observations? Yes. So this mu and sigma that you have during inference, you're gonna use it on your validation data. You're gonna use it on your test data. And you're gonna use it when you put your product, your model into production. Does that answer your question? Another question, would it be beneficial to apply batch normalization in the first layer? You, you normally do batch normalization right after your convolution, right after some parameters, some matrix vector multiplication. Why don't you do it on your input data? Because your input data is already normalized. And there is no idea of uh, covariate shift on your input data because the statistics are gonna be static. You have your entire training data in front of you, just compute your mean and variance of the data and normalize your data. 
before putting them into before pushing them into your neural network. So you usually do batch normalization after some weight uh, matrix matrix vector multiplication of some sort. Let it be convolution or something, or even fully connected. Then you do your batch norm, and it's going to be before your activation because you want the things that go inside your activation to behave ni nicely because the nonlinearity is on G. Everything else is linear, practically speaking. Does that answer your question? Can you explain why you would want the model to be less sensitive to the choice of the activation function? Because when you're designing, you're referring to this point, less sensitive to activation functions. When you are designing your architecture, you have a lot of choices. One of those choices is the choice of your activation function. Should I use ReLU activation? Should I use leaky ReLU? Should I use switch activation? Should I use sigmoid? Should I use TAMH? Should I use GILU, which is Gaussian linear units? And then it would be nice if you have a method that's going to say it doesn't really matter. Just pick one and design your architecture. Maybe just use your uh, ReLU activation. You don't need to think about one other degree of freedom to worry about. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Any other ones? The question is, so an analogy for this is forcing the input to every layer to be Gaussian in the same way we want our data to be Gaussian. Uh, it's not only about being Gaussian and you don't want to make your data to be Gaussian. It's probably not gonna be Gaussian. You want it to uh, have reasonable values across different channels and across different pixels when you go from one layer to the next. You don't want your values coming out of this vector matrix multiplication to be to take crazy values. Crazy, I mean crazy big or crazy small. And to be inconsistent, for instance, one of the entries be much smaller than the other entry. So you want everything to, be, to behave nicely, to have the same scale, to have the same size. And it's not necessarily going to end up being Gaussian. It's just going to have a nice mean, which is going to be around zero, and it's going to have a nice variance. So a Gaussian distribution, you can define it by its mean and variance, and you can define it uniquely. Other distributions, you need to start worrying about the third order moment, the fourth order moment. Maybe your distribution is skewed. Maybe it has a tail. So those sorts of higher order statistics, they make these uh, observations, your X is to be non-Gaussian, but still, they're going to have nice values because you're controlling their variance. You're controlling their mean. Does that answer your question? And any other ones? Okay, perfect. So these are all good properties. You can increase your learning rate. It means that your model is going to learn faster. You're going to be less sensitive to initialization. It means that you don't have to worry too much about how you initialize your network. You don't have to worry too much about what activation function to use. It's going to have some regularization effect. It means that you're not going to memorize your data, the training data. You're actually going to be able to generalize to your test data. And if you want to, if this is a good thing, preserve gradient magnitudes. Why is it helpful? It is helpful when you're doing backpropagation, when you're training your neural network. Things are not going to vanish or explode your gradients. So that's a good question. It says, is having to calculate the mean variance every mini batch a drawback in terms of number of operations? Yes. So you have some extra operations that you need to do, but it's not that bad because your mini batch is usually small. So it's not too much of an overhead. And during training, you don't care how much time you take to train your neural network. The faster is going to be better, but remember, the aim of machine learning and deep learning is to come up with an algorithm for the production. And the algorithm that you're going to end up with using batch norm is going to be as fast as without batch norm, because these are pre-computed, mu and sigma. So the question is when we say mean, is the mean of each individual filter produced by convolution? I'm having a tough time visualizing it. So here is my question for you. If I give you 10 vectors, how do you average them out? How do you compute the mean? Exactly. So you're going to do it element-wise. You're going to take the first element of the first vector, 
the first element of the last vector, add them up. This is going to be the first entry of the summation, and then you divide it by the number of vectors that you had. The second entry is the same. It's going to be element-wise. They're going to be done independently, and you can actually do them in parallel. And then in the end, you're going to end up with an average vector. Why did I mention vector? Because an image is just a set of vectors. And actually, in your convolution, you're averaging across your mini batch and your resolution. So you're basically averaging a bunch of d-dimensional vectors. Does that answer your question? OK, perfect. A lot of operations in deep learning are just element-wise. So that's your default. If they don't tell you that it's not element-wise, it's going to be element-wise. That's the default option. Any other questions about batch normalization? I think we are finishing right on time. For those of you who have more questions, you're more than welcome to stay and ask. For those of you who want to leave, you can leave. And then I guess by now you know the structure of the class. Whenever there is a video, you need to watch it, come to the class, ask questions. And whenever we don't have a video, we are gonna, I'm going to cover that in class. OK, I guess uh, I'm going to be around. And the ones who want to leave, you can leave. I'm going to be around for the ones who want to ask questions. Is there any experiment done by combining LRN, dropout, and networking network concepts? I'm sure there are, but uh, usually if you have batch normalization for the task of classification, you don't need to do LRN. Batch normalization is going to do. It's going to overwrite what LRN is doing, the normalization. And I'm sure I'm saying I'm sure somebody has done that because when they do their experiments, when they are writing a report, they are, they are writing a paper, they have a lot of failed cases that they don't report on. They're just going to say, we came up with this architecture and it's doing really good. They're not going to tell you that they tried network in network with dropout and LRN, and it wasn't as good as they expected them to be. But that's a good idea if you want to explore it. You're going to learn a lot. OK, sure.